Let's get to the punching. All right, welcome everybody to the second of three Oathbringer podcasts. I am Craig Hanks, your duskier than normal host. I'm fighting off a throat infection, which makes me sound amazing. Uh, but uh, over there, well, he's duller than a parchment slave and just as marbled, it's Todd Wenty. At least I don't sound like Barry White today. <laughs> <laughs> and she's the girl who looked up, the girl who stood up, and also the girl who screwed up. It's Megan Smythe. Everybody has a thing. I will own that one. All right. Good for you. And if he were a city, he'd have at least three unmade living in him. It's Ryan Bruckman. Is that an STD reference? Ew. <laughs> oh, nicely done. Not so nice. <laughs> That's not so nice. I've heard nicer. Um, okay. So anyway, uh, welcome, everybody. I, I hope you're looking forward to today's podcast and... If we ever say anything that uh, doesn't make a lot of sense, it's because we're also recording this on video. So for those of you watching on YouTube, hello. Hey. Hey. Hi. Um, anyway, so we, we also recorded the last one. It has not yet been posted to YouTube. Possibly we'll just do all three and then release them in one big batch. I don't know. That would make people happy. Well. One right after the other. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's happiness. That's a relative thing, I guess. We're just holding out so we can call the whole series The Kraken, so Craig can be like, release The Kraken. <laughs> the Kraken is my... Uh, never mind. You know what? Never yeah, mind. No, no, don't go there. Don't just go gonna there. Leave, I'm going to leave that one right where it is. Okay, so, and that's also... I should also mention, uh, if you're thinking to yourself, boy, the sound on this episode is awful. I know we got some of that on the first Oathbringer episode. Well, I don't care. Uh, because we are recording in the unfinished studio uh and so there there's no there is nothing in here there's no foam on the walls there's no paint on the walls there's no carpet there's no nothing uh so talk we're, about echoey we're just glad you picked the nails up off the floor so we didn't have to negotiate those this time <laughs> well <laughs> uh but it is coming along so uh ryan and i spent a few hours yesterday uh doing the the uh, siding mm -hmm. so that's coming along pretty well anyway so we'll get there not to worry now let's uh get to the housekeeping stuff before we go to oathbringer i want to mention reddit the legendarium.reddit.com is where you can go join the conversation and i hope you do and thank you to everybody not only on the legendarium subreddit but also on the stormlight archive subreddit who uh, participated in the pre-episode question uh gathering whatever you want to call that so yeah thanks everybody for your submissions there and we'll hope you'll join us at the legendarium.reddit.com for the uh post game show i guess we'll call it and then also i want to mention we are doing a giveaway because this is stormlight archives we've got to do some kind of giveaway right so uh we have and i, I haven't yet decided whether i want to rip ryan's copy out of his cold dead hands or my own uh, but we have an advanced review copy that uh, that we would love to give away. Uh, one of us will end up giving away. But but uh, either way, here's how you enter it. To get the Legendarium edition of the advanced review copy of Oathbringer. Ryan, does yours have some notes in it? Nope. No, no notes. I, I, I abstain from putting notes in there as well. Uh, but maybe we can write a little note up front or something. I don't know. Uh, but if you want the Legendarium edition of the Oathbringer Advance Review copy, then you need to get on Twitter and you tweet at us, uh, at LegendariumPod, and use the hashtag Oathbringer. If you do that, I, I don't care what it is you tweet, you can tell us how bad we smell even just over your headphones. You can tell us uh, how much we changed your life uh, for the better. I'm expecting fewer of those. Uh, but you can, so you can tweet whatever you want. You just have to tweet at us using the hashtag Oathbringer. That is your, uh, that's your entry. And so if you do that, just be aware that in three weeks when I uh, pick the winner out of a hat, I'm going to tweet back at that person. So you'd be, better be ready to uh, respond because that would be lame if you won and didn't get your book. So. Uh, anyway, if that makes sense, let's go ahead and move on. Everybody good? Yeah. Yep. Good, great, grand, wonderful. No yelling on the bus. It's time for Ken's intro. Yay. Let's do it. Okay, Ken, what you got for us this week?
All right, you punchy guys and swordy fellows, time for some Stormlight insight. Things look dire for our heroes. That means it must be parts three and four. Dalinar is learning that uniting them means more than just the kingdoms. Bondsmithing also makes you a pretty dynamite mason. So far, he gets Thalena and Azimir and their oath gates on Team Radiant. Yay, thanks to some clever work putting statues back together and learning languages with a touch. He's feeling pretty good about himself, until he's not. When he suddenly and forcefully receives the rest of his previously erased memories, and they are so dire that they literally knock him off his feet. Meanwhile, Elikar continues his hero training when he and the Love Triangle Radiance lead a team to assess the besieged Kolinar and secure the Oath Gate. And all it takes is Shallan getting stabbed through the gut and shot in the face for the team to realize that not all is okay in Kolinar. They find not one, not two, but three unmade influencing the capital. One, a black cloud making itself at home over Castle Kolin and inside the brain of Queen Asadon. Another that corrupted the sprint of the city and inspired a creepy cult. And another that stalks Shallan through mirrors. While Shallan tries to infiltrate the cult of the Crazy Sprint and get to the Oath Gate by playing Robin Hood and getting herself impaled, Kaladin joins the City Wall Guard, quickly finds himself inspiring yet another group of disillusioned and disgruntled castoffs, and finds another potential Radiant, or a special guest from another series, take your pick. With some backup in tow, Team Kalin leads a suicide charge into the castle to rescue the royal family and then Oathgate back to safety. Except possessed Mrs. Elicar doesn't want to go, so Elicar scoops up Junior and makes a beeline for the exit. But the running sword battle to the Oath Gate turns into a clash of good versus good for Kaladin as he watches all of his groups of rejects wipe each other out simultaneously, punctuated by Moash, the anti-Kaladin, driving his spear right through my prediction and Elicar just as he was saying the final word of the first oath. In the words of Larry from Groundhog Day, he might be okay. <sighs> Adolin and Vivint. I mean, Azure, grab the once again catatonic and broken Kaladin, get to the Oathgate control room just as Shallan turns the key and sends them all to... Shadesmar? Well, that's unfortunate for them, but it gives us a fantastic in-depth first look at the cognitive realm. We get to see full-bodied Sprint, including the undead Banshee-like Sprint of Adolin's Shardblade. As they make their way to another access back to the physical realm, the gang uncovers the Unmade's nefarious plan. While Dalinar deals with all of the painful memories of killing his own wife and vengeance wrecking an entire city population, the fledgling alliance is coming together quite nicely. Until kindly little old frail Teravangian enacts the most telegraphed double cross of all time when he orchestrates the release of all of Dalinar's secrets simultaneously. It culminates with the translation of the final piece of the Don chant and the disclosure that we have met the enemy and it was us all along. No. It's not true. Impossible. The Parshendi were always on Roshar, humans come from Skadriel or Nalthus or somewhere and started gobbling up land, displacing Parshendi and handing out rot sprint covered blankets. Probably. Things look bleak. So, where exactly were the humans fleeing and how guilty should our heroes feel about the sins of their fathers? Humans invaded Roshar, but the Voidbringers are still bad, right? Gavilar, was he on his way to becoming a bondsmith when he died or something more sinister? How about now? Is Teft sufficiently broken now? When can we get that Vasher and Vivenna novella that really needs to happen? No, seriously, what the heck is up with Renarin? Dude is weird. All right, that's enough from me. Let's hear from our Radiance Roundtable. Oh, and Duck Moash. Dang it, I hate it when typos make it in my script. <laughs> <laughs> was that your fake laugh? That was, that fake was, laugh. That was, that was, it was pretty terrible. I, Brody. Please I, couldn't tell, I couldn't tell if you were fake laughing because of Ken's last line or if you were fake laughing because <laughs> he went on for approximately the entire episode. <laughs> so our, our job is basically done. Yeah, that yeah. was that Thanks, was Ken. a long time. Thanks, Thanks Ken. Uh, anyway, so okay, thoughts. First thing I need to correct Ken on something. If I know there's many of you whose ears are bleeding right now because there was a uh, unmade reference made that is incorrect. Um, there are three unmade in the city of Kolinar, but Ken had them assigned wrong powers. Saja Anat is the one who does the corrupting of Spren and is the one that Shalon sees in the mirror. And then there are two others. There's the one that causes the rebel, which is the heart. Um, I'm not very good at remember, remembering their names. I remember Mol, I believe Molalok is something else. Uh, but uh, all the unmade have names, which you should learn because that's you have to learn all the names in this series, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, that'll get a throaty laugh. Well, you out have of me. to remember them because if you, I've I haven't read section five yet, and I can't go to the seventeenth chart or any of these websites to look these things up. Because I'm afraid of spoilers. For for those who want to know where to look inside of the book, it's in the headers 
it's you know how in yes. uh, words of radiance and way of kings it's yeah. there's a letter written there in this they actually go through two or three different books different sections um and one of them actually is about the unmade and it's um hesse's hesse's yes the mythica Hes the mythica Hesse's thank you mythica um but yeah so the the correct was is, it are you sure it was hesse or was it hesse's girl Ladies and gentlemen, Craig is on medication. So, <laughs> He's really sorry. proud of himself so for that silence. one, too. <laughs> People get to see the look on your face now. They're going to know. They're going to know how proud Cheers, you are. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> and, they, and they now understand a little better what we deal with, too. Yeah. But anyway, just the whole thing about that is Saja not corrupt Spren. The rebel is caused by the heart. And then the one that was infecting the queen, um, whose names I cannot remember at this exact moment, but... Um, I'm sure Joff Wu will throw it back in my face and run Reddit. <laughs> so there you go. You're one. I'll be the Ken corrector. <laughs> well, I think we can all take on that role. That's a big That's job. no problem. Although, no, I, I'm not sure that I'm quite qualified because, I mean, we're joking about not remembering all the names. I'll be honest. Like, I don't remember all the events after finishing sections yeah, three and four yeah. I, and then yeah. I, so I, I finish the sections and then i go back and read some people's reddit comments and i'm like I, I, yeah i'm drawing a blank i'm sorry did that happen in section I've got, three i thought I got that was nothing. in section two yeah exactly so okay well let's uh let's talk about what you guys want to talk about first because i know we do have quite a few reddit comments to get to but um what people don't know is that before we started recording uh, i was complained at very loudly for not getting to all of our notes. Uh, so I want to get to some of our notes. Maybe we first. should start with maybe we should start with the person who took the most notes. Uh, no. <laughs> let's let's talk to the one who was complaining the most about not getting to yeah, talk that's about true. His notes. That's true. Todd, hey, you're Todd. the Todd, you're the complainer, you're the kick offer. Yeah. All right. So kicker kicker offer. So my my <laughs> biggest problem with with all of our notes is that I forget. It's it's uh, it, it's at least equal parts me forgetting to go into all of the notes that I took in my book and not having enough time. Um, but I took, I took two kinds of notes as we were going through and made two kinds of highlights. One of them were the section three stuff uh, or the level three stuff that we talk about oftentimes when we're going through books and some really, really wonderful pieces. Um, one of my favorites in this section uh, was when Dalinar was talking to, I think it's Noah Don. Um, and I could be wrong on, on who he was talking to. Uh, but he says, sometimes a hypocrite is nothing more than a man who is in the process of changing. And I think it was a person that he was talking to. Because Delanar was complaining about the fact that he felt like such a hypocrite, trying to pull the, the Knights Radiant together, but he didn't know what he was doing and all these kinds of things. Um, and and I, was, I was struck by this contrast between Dalinar becoming this person that we're seeing, that, we're, that we've been exposed to all the way through this, and getting these glimpses as to who he was in the past and how, for me at least, how insightful and bittersweet this, this quote was about Dalinar and about what Dalinar is going through. But that also takes me very much to, to um, learning more about what the Blackthorn really is. Um, not who he is, but what he is. Mm -hmm. I, a, a force of absolute destruction that takes out everything in his path. And it makes it a little bit more clear for me why every time he was trying to enlist people into the aid of uniting for to protect Roshar, why everybody was like, uh-uh, we're not going to have anything to do with you. Well, no wonder uh, the last time that anybody had anything to do with him, he wound up killing his wife and burning a, an entire city to the ground because he was mad at himself. Um, I mean... Uh, what a what a what an interesting opportunity we have to look at this person. The other thing that that made me think about too, as I was reading it, is as he's starting to remember all of these things. That's when odium comes to him, and I'm wondering if that's going to play a role in in part five, uh, as as odium spends as odium invades his memories and his dreams a little bit more frequently if we're going to find out that part of that is because he's now able to remember things that he was doing back then and that passion of destruction and the thrill that always accompanied that makes him susceptible or open to odium's influence do you think that odium has a hand in his memory in the fact that he is remembering because he's he's by the old magic had not been able to remember up until this point yeah i, I i'm i would hesitate to say that 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 odium is the cause, 
but I think that there is a connection between um, between Dalinar swearing the oaths and the unmaking of the old magic that prevented him from hearing um, from hearing Evie's name, Evie's name, Evie, yeah, yeah, who knows? Evie, um, and and I I think the the connection there, um, and it's and it wasn't just his uh, oath to the to uh, Stormfather, but also also his oath to Navani mm-hmm. um, that starts unraveling the old magic. So I'm I'm curious to see what that connection is. I'm sure there is going to be a connection. And if I were to guess one, Sanderson would probably steal it away from me in the last five pages of chat, of part five anyway. So I'm not going to hazard a guess. I, I learned my lesson after mm-hmm. all of the all of the ones that I got wrong when we did Mistborn. I'm not going to try <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Uh, all right. So, Megan, what do you want to talk about? Well, I, I think it's interesting, Todd bringing up Dalinar and Dalinar trying to deal with these memories coming back because in a lot of the same ways, Shalon is going through the same thing. And she's doing she's doing a similar thing where she is trying to compartmentalize her um, her issues and the things that she's upset about. And as Vale, she can just ignore them. And as Radiant, she can rise above them. Um, but she doesn't want to deal with it as Shallan. And when she discovers that the Swift Spren was uh, directly responsible for getting a whole bunch of innocent people killed, she falls apart. And Wit tells her she has to face it and she has to figure out who Shallan is. And actually, she's a lot stronger than she thinks she's going to be. And it's it's interesting reading that and in parallel reading, um, oh, actually, I guess it's in the next part, reading Dalinar in the past and his trying to deal with having murdered Evie so horribly um, and going on a drinking binge and just withdrawing within himself. And now he knows that he goes to the night watcher and um, has that, like they're both just trying to avoid the issue. And Dalinar at this point is starting to not accept it, but he's starting to move on and realize there's a lot more going on and I can't just focus on this one memory. Sure. Uh, but I, I just think it's fascinating that they have these parallel things going on. And I'm really, really glad that, I mean, Wit said that he wasn't there for Shallan. Like that was not the reason that he had shown up on Roshar, but he does end up being the person that she can talk to and the person who can empathize and who can give her advice because she has not had that. Mm-hmm. Yasna is definitely not the person that you can go and just talk to. And Navani is somebody, Navani and Dalinar are both people who really intimidate her. Um, and Adolin just keeps thinking she's like this miracle, amazing, radiant person and putting her on a pedestal and she can't compete with that because he's also yeah. perfect. And I just, I love that Adolin told her that he murdered Sadius. Sadius, thank you so much. It just... It was nice. It was nice that he was able to tell somebody so, that. So a couple of things that I want to go on there. First okay. of all, um, the revelation when Adolin tells her that mm-hmm. he murdered Sadius mm-hmm. uh, was kind of a, a forehead slapper for me. Just like, ugh, that's the resolution here. Yeah. This is how somebody finds out. And there yeah. could be there could be A more. resolution. Yeah, it's a resolution. A resolution. I yeah. just really wanted that to like blow up. Know. You know, kind of the way that uh, uh, I can't remember if that's part five, so never mind. Yeah. Um, but it's blowing up for everyone else. Like Dalinar blew up and he became this drinking lush, right, right, right. and Shalon, you know, went off and was Swiss friend and then like had a moral collapse. So it's kind of nice that somebody actually faced it straight on and said, I did this. And Shalon was like, oh. Well, right. But he's, uh, yeah, I guess he's only told one person. She's right. not going to go tell anybody about it. True. You know, it's, it's so it, it felt anticlimactic, I guess, is really what I'm getting at. And so that was because it was such a big deal at the end of book two. Yeah. I was really looking forward to that being a driving uh, factor in book three's storyline. And it just wasn't. It was a non-issue yeah. for I'm, most of the book. So anyway, that's that, that's all. It was just... I wonder, Something I was open for didn't get. I wonder if part of the reason for that is that Adolin hasn't sworn any oaths, and so there's no reason that there's there's less on there's there's less on the uh, on the riding on this decision as to who he tells and when and all those other kinds of things than there is for some of these other folks about the decisions that they make. Right. I mean, granted, he's he's in a position of power, and there's going to be ramifications, I'm sure. Um, uh, yeah, Amaram and Ile yeah. are going to flip out. <laughs> If they're still alive when he gets there. Oh, yeah. 
So I, the other thing I wanted, sorry, the other thing I wanted to bring up was you talked about Shalon's kind of some of Shalon's journey. Yeah. Her emotional journey. Now, we talked about this in the last episode, so I don't necessarily want to belabor this, but do you feel any differently or any or are your opinions solidified when it comes to Shalon and uh, the love triangle? How, how much you enjoy reading her in this book? Oh, and I have I've never not enjoyed reading her. I struggle with love triangles in general, and that's not her fault. That's not B Sand's fault. Um, B, B Sand. I just called him B Sand, like J Lo. You're welcome, Mr. Sanderson. Um, Mr. Sanderson. <laughs> We're going to get back and Mr. forth. Back and forth. Back and forth. Sanderson. Uh, <laughs> we've already decided I'm going to be one of those parchment that gets murdered, right? Okay. Um, anyway, I, I, I'm enjoying her story. I am really, really curious to see what happens when her brothers show up. If her brothers show up, I feel like that's really when the stuff is going to hit the fan. When the shalom hits the fan. Yeah, it's, yeah. that's going to be a problem. Um, I, I, I'm distracted by the fact that I felt like the whole Shades Mars storyline was really, really boring. Um, but just so much <laughs> happened while they were in Kolinar. Um, and I I liked the way it was handled. Craig, you made a comment after the last um, podcast that you had appreciated the way that the love triangle was handled in three and four. And I, I would agree with that. I'm really glad that Adolin kind of has an idea that, oh, it looks like Shalon's looking at the bridge boy that's weird i still think bright lord brooding eyes is annoying but that's just me um but i i really <laughs> like i like shalan i like the way that this story is being handled she's a 17 year old girl who has been very sheltered her whole life and is dealing with a lot and doesn't have a whole lot of help um and yet has had to deal with some of the biggest issues a human could ever have to deal with in the murder of her father and mother and and theft and saving a family and yeah it's she I, has quite a, a a boulder on her shoulders yeah i'm excited to see where it goes mm -hmm. uh all right so ryan i've seen you glancing through some notes want well, to throw it your way well i was i was actually referring to some things in regarding shallan's story because uh her story has been on my first read through of this book was probably one that i cared the least about and got really frustrated with having to deal with Oh, great. We're dealing with different personalities here. Not really in necessarily in a mental capacity. I'm not really concerned about that, like we talked about in the last episode. But for me, it was, it's, I, I'm just getting tired of why is she not able to control a little bit more? Um, and then we get into her, she has two conversations with Wit, and they are both major, majorly amazing chapters in this yes. book. Yes. If, if somebody asked you, what is the greatest chapter in all of fantasy literature? How could you ever justify not saying the girl who stood up? Um, right now, because I can't think of anything else right now, I couldn't, but it is, it is absolutely one of the best chapters ever. I actually mm -hmm. sent um, that chapter, just that chapter, I copied it out and sent it to a friend who is dealing with um, some very difficult things right now. And basically, I had to give a little bit of backstory, but this chapter was enough to stand on its own. The lessons in there were enough with just a little bit of information about the characters to say, here are some incredible lessons to learn about dealing with difficult things. And I think that the girl who stood up is, if you can't read through this entire series, which I obviously recommend people do, um, that is a chapter that is worth taking the time to read anyway. Just have someone explain who the two characters are and kind of how they get there. Uh, but there's a couple different lessons that Wit points out to Shalom that really resonated with me. Um, in the first conversation that they have, she's talking about, they're, they're kind of dealing with the personalities issue, and she's like, I want to change the world. And he says, be careful. First of all, the quote here is, that's well and good, but be careful. The world predates you, and she has seniority. And it kind of took me a minute. I'm like, whoa, you know, especially in today's age, you know, we're sitting here like everyone wants to to make their mark and change the world and, and make things better or whatever. Hold on. Other people start a podcast. Hold on for a second <laughs> and take a, and take a moment to realize that the world has seniority. And I'm not saying that the way things are, are right, but I'm saying before you decide to start making changes or trying to push for things to be different, understand where the world has come from or where your the situation has come from yeah. and where and why it is where it is now so that you can affect a meaningful change. Uh, 
Chesterton Spence. Sure. You know what I'm talking about? No. no. Oh, G.K. Chesterton uh, was a philosopher 100 years ago or so. And uh, he came up with the idea of Chesterton's fence, which is, uh, so two, two men are walking along a road, they come upon a fence, and one man says, let's tear it down. Oh, and the other okay. man says, no, you go home and figure out why the fence is there. And when you can convince me why the fence is there, then maybe I will let you tear it down. Yeah. That, yeah, that kind of thing. You have to understand yeah. things yeah. before you try to change them. And that's sound advice for just about any aspect of life. I think, and I think it's probably one of the reasons um, why when when that chapter gets read, it gets skipped, it gets missed, but then you come back to it and you say, oh, no, 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 this really does have some power. Yeah, and when you get to the point, like Shalon in the story here, she gets when she's like, I'm a radiant, saving the world is in the job description. She realizes that she has to do something. It's not an option to just think about it or to not do something. So Wit then tells her to be wise about it. And he says, there are two kinds of important men, Shalon. There are those who, when the boulder of time rolls towards them, stand up in front of it and hold out their hands. All their lives they've been told how great they are, and they assume the world will, <laughs> the world itself will bend to their whims as, they nurse, as their nurse did when fetching them a fresh cup of milk. Those men end up squished. <laughs> <laughs> squished. What a wonderful word. Oh, I wait. know, and the thing is, we, just about everybody here, probably knows someone who does this, who says... I don't like this. I don't like the way it's being handled. I don't like the, the way that things are dealt with. And you know what? Change. Not me. You change. There's a time and a place for that. And I don't remember what movie or book it is where it's like, you know, plant the roots and make the world change thing. I don't remember. Uh, that's Civil War. So, yeah, okay. Oh, that's right. Uh, Captain America's yep. philosophy. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. There's a time and a place for it, but just realize you might get squished if you're wrong. Um, <laughs> And then he goes on to say, other men stand to the side when the boulder of time passes, but are quick to say, see what I did? I made the boulder roll there, so don't make me do it again. <laughs> and these men end up getting everyone else squished. <laughs> and then he says that there's a third type of person. And this is where, if you want to grab a piece from here on how to deal with things, this is probably the most sound advice for dealing with it. Because there is, but they are oh so rare. They know they can't stop the boulder, so they walk beside it, study it, and bide their time and they shove it ever so slightly to create a deviation in its path. These are the men, well, these are the men who actually change the world and they terrify me for men never see as far as they think they do. Mm -hmm. So even in this bit of information that is very, you know, relatively sound to minor, to make minor adjustments, to walk alongside, to understand what you're doing, have direction, see forward, make these things happen, realize that you may not have the vision down the road that you think you do, and you may still get people squished, and you may still end up squished, but at least it's a better approach than just being like, "Hey, I'm going to stop this boulder myself." Yeah, and that's yeah. the that's the first of Wit and Shalons. The for me, there's like four four moments in this book that I sit here and I just I I stop and I go back and I like study the chapters religiously about the lessons that can be contained in there, and both Wit and Shalons' discussions in this first one, and then the girl who stood up. And then there's a one in part five um, that we'll talk about later. But So I thought you were going with the girl who stood up. I want to talk about that chapter. Can somebody summarize it for us? Yeah. Ooh, so okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So we get to revisit something that happened earlier that was foreshadowed in the book a little bit when Shalon finds the theater in Urihiru. <laughs> yes, I know you love how I, I say it. that. Yeah. Um, she starts telling the story of the girl who stood up, which is a story of a girl who lives in a world of darkness, who finds a wall that no one goes past and decides what's on, why, why is there a wall here? What's on the other side? And in the first telling of the story, we don't really get very far beyond this point. And it's told with her abilities um, as a, as a, as a light, light weaver. weaver. And so we get to the girl who stood up and she is thoroughly broken by having cause the deaths of some children and youth as she has tried to be helpful and has in, found inadvertently inadvertently caused these deaths and realized that going back to this previous conversation she tried to nudge the boulder and got someone squished yep she tried to do it and it breaks her because she has had to deal with death and everything else so much in her life already that she's thoroughly shaken by this and wit comes in and says First thing he says to her isn't, are you okay? And then he says, 
the people who are responsible have been dealt with. And it wasn't me. It was a militia formed. So there is some good that has come from your actions anyway. So realize there's something there. And then he asks her if she knows the story of the girl who stood up. Or the, no, if he, she knows the, the story of um, girl who up. the girl who looked up. And they revisit that story, but they go all the way through to the point where the girl goes to the other side of the wall. They realize God's light is on the other side. There's, there's storms, there's everything. And when she brings it back, the people would never go back to what it was before um, because they now have light. They can see that and they're willing to deal with the storms and everything. But she realizes that the, the wall wasn't there to keep that out. It was to keep the people in. And there's, there's a handful of lessons inside of there in terms of um, uh, understanding purpose and things like that. And then he starts to talk to her about responsibility and taking that it's okay to mess up. It's okay to hurt, but don't think that you deserve it. Which is one of the, which I cried the first time I read that, because that is something that I know that I've dealt with personally. Um, you get to a point where you feel that you deserve the punishment of, or the consequences of your actions beyond what may actually be consequence. Um, and so we get a, we get a beautiful narrative story of this girl and we get all these lessons between Wit and Shalon about dealing with the ramifications of this and being okay as a person after dealing with tragedy and, and these things. Well, there you go. All right. Well, I just wanted to make sure we brought up the chapter. I don't have a ton to expound on beyond what you've already said. Uh, but it was it, it was definitely a moment where I, I was I tweeted out three or four chapter headings as I was reading the advanced review copy and I couldn't uh, spoil anything but I would snap up a picture and say you guys wait till you get to this chapter yeah. then that was one of them where it, I just thought it was incredibly important I want to I before we jump off it I want to read just a few of the the highlighted statements inside of it that sure. I absolutely love um, first one is wit here um, says, I cannot judge the worth of a life. I would not dare to attempt it. If there is anybody in the Cosmere who probably actually knows that or could make a call on that, it's wit. It's wit. Yeah. And so for him to say that, it really teaches us the, there's a lot of value to a single person. Um, reminds me of one of my favorite Doctor Who quotes when he says, um, I've never met anybody who wasn't interesting. Or who wasn't important. Or who wasn't yeah. important, Yeah. Uh, you tried to help the people of the market. You mostly failed. This is life. The longer you live, the more you fail. Failure is the mark of a life well lived. Mm -hmm. In turn, the only way to live without failure is to be of no use to anyone. Trust me, I've practiced. The world is monstrous at times, and there are those who would have you believe that you are terrible by association. I am. No. For you see, it flows the other direction. You are not worse for your association with the world, but it is better for its association with you than live and let your failures be a part of you. It's terrible to have been hurt. It's unfair and awful and horrid. But Shalon, it is okay to live on. Are oh, you going to cry? You're going to cry. I'm trying. I wish Kaladin had heard that quote. Oh, yeah. My second read through has been a lot more Kaladin centric because that's who I relate to most. The first one was very Dalinar heavy, but yeah, yeah Kal Kaladin could use this same conversation. Yeah. No wit said he nodded toward the version of her still standing up. You will, Shalon. If you do not trust yourself, can you trust me? For in you I see a woman more wonderful than any of the lies. I promise you that woman is worth protecting. You are worth protecting. It's all right to hurt. Find the balance. Accept the pain, but don't accept that you deserve it. If you haven't read that chapter, like those are the things that like I just stopped and I they're marked and I like yep. wept through all of them because at some point in time in your life. So you will need someone to come and tell you these things again. And there may be a time when you need to tell them other people it as well. It's difficult to, um, when, because, because of, of my time constraints, I'm often listening rather than reading. And, uh, in all fairness, most of my, most of my listening comes during the time that I'm driving to work or driving home and driving at freeway speeds and listening to that particular piece be read, uh, was a challenge and caused me to find the nearest exit ramp so that I could pull over and do two things. One of them was highlight some sections and the other was wipe my eyes. It was, it was moving. Um, but it's, it's also powerful in its foreshadowing. At least it was for me as we get to the end of part four and we learn 
who the void bringers really were, who the monsters really were. And I, re- and I remembered, uh, as I was, as I was listening to that and realizing, oh, okay. So human beings are these monsters. I wonder what that does or what that will do to Shalon's understanding of this story of the girl who, uh, the girl who looked up, the girl who stood up, climbs over the fence climbs over the wall and is recognized as a monster. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I have the feeling that Shalon is not done dealing with the ramifications of this beautiful parable that impacts everybody in the Cosmere, I think. Well, you're not the only one who wants to talk about that because both um, temporal shenanigans, whose name I love, <laughs> and also convoluted boy, uh, who says, if you want to refer to any of my comments by name, just say Sean. So Sean wants a shout out. Sean gets a shout out. Hey. Uh, all right. So they ask basically the same thing with this revelation, with the revelation that humans are the invaders on Roshar. Does that change your opinion of the conflict? Um, and, you know, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, all that, that sort of thing. I am not sure that it changes mine much. It definitely sheds more light on it, and it it gives sympathy where there was no sympathy or little sympathy before. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm not sure that I, I I'm not sure that it changes all that much for me because I've always been more along the lines of uh, don't visit the sins of the fathers on the head of the children, mm-hmm. uh, and so the idea that well, your, you know, how many, however many thousands of great grandfather he invaded, so you're the bad guy. That doesn't that doesn't compute for me. That yeah. doesn't sit very well. And so, I think it, it can be, it's it's perfectly legitimate to say that there are two just sides of the war. Mm-hmm. Um, at least at least for right now. What concerns me about this revelation is I can I can see Dalinar kind of wanting to not necessarily wave the white flag, but come to some kind of accommodation where, I mean, he already started doing that with Venli where, you know, maybe we can have a parchment high prince or maybe we could share the land somehow. Like we, we can make this work. Um, and I just think of, you know, we get the flashback of his trying to parlay with Tanalan, the younger and... Um, the way that that all worked out and resulting in the burning of, uh, now I can't think of the name of the town, but he, but yeah, the rift. Rift. Um, and I mean, would he be willing to try that again? Thank you. Now that he remembers how that whole thing worked out, would he be willing to try that again? And I would hope that he would. Um, but would the parchment be willing? It's just, it's so interesting. They, all of the different leaders, queen Fen and everybody talking about how the parchment, reacted in each of the different lands um the ones in easier i don't know one of them they lodged a protest or something they like Mm -hmm. they whatever you would do in that town is what they did the alethi would go to war so those guys all went to kolinar and suited up and went to war uh, and Thalen, they all got on board the ships and sailed them away. Which is why we need the coalition more than ever. Dalinar and everybody working together so that they can all work with all of their... Par- because if they're if the Parshmen are going to react the way that they the humans would in that world, they need to figure out how are the humans going to react and can they work with the... I mean, yeah. we have like seven more books in this series, <laughs> so it's not going to end anytime soon. Yeah. Well, and I like what um, the, the, the question is one that Dalinar starts dealing with too. How do you, how do you handle this revelation for yourself? Mm-hmm. You know, we, we look at it from a, from a standpoint of the story and say, oh man, now we understand. And, and it also made me remember Kaladin having his little time as a, as a prisoner with the, with the Parshman and figuring out how to help them make fire and and preserve grain and do all those kinds of things and he develops this sense of compassion for them and it, with the revelation I, I i feel that same sense of compassion oh my goodness there's something a lot more involved in here but dalinar turning around and saying yeah but they still want to kill us mm-hmm. we still have to figure out how to and and while the parchment may be being played being used as as pawns or tools in this grand scheme for the the unmade to wipe out humanity. I mean, what we're, 
what's really at stake is not the battle between the parchment and the humans. It's the battle between the gods of the Cosmere uh, and Odium trying to destroy all of those kinds of things. And when we escalate it to that level, it's more, it's less an issue of do, how do we fight this war and more an issue of how do we educate everybody about what the true war really is all about. And that's, that's kind of where I come down on this is the first thing is the war between the, the Parshendi and the Alethi. This doesn't really change a whole lot for me because that war was started out of the vengeance pact. Um, because of the murder of Gavilar. Yep. It wasn't about invading lands or anything. It was, that's how that started. Admittedly, it has carried on. Um, but that's that's how their war started. What has changed here is who are who is in control of the Parshendi. Because those, the Parshmen who have been given form, whatever, they take over, you know, they're... The fused. It's, well, uh, specifically the the ones who are, as you said, like the, the, the Thalans and the... Yeah. yeah. They, they've taken on the personalities of the lands that they're in, but they are being driven by the fused which is this other group that are made up of the previous, the ones who were invaded, Parshman, like the ones who had to deal with it, who are angry over thousands of years of dealing with this. And so that's what they're coming there. That, that's, it's, it's this ancient grudge that they're carrying, that they want to wipe the humans off for coming and taking their lands. And so to me, knowing that the humans invaded, what it does is it does give me a little more compassion for the Parshman and the Parshendi, but it doesn't give me any for the fused, for the group that is trying very much to wipe the humans out, out of revenge. What the, the way the Alethi approached their original war is how the fused are approaching their, the other direction. And maybe that's a little bit of just desserts, but I can't get behind either one. I couldn't get behind the Alethi, you know, getting their vengeance pact. I, I can't get behind the fused doing that. What I want to know and what that tells me most, if the humans are the void bringer, A, what is the void that was brought? Um, and that's... Oh, I don't know. Brandon Sanderson seems to enjoy... Um, oh, oh shoot. What show is that? Oh, is, did, you ever, did you ever see True Lies? Yes. And the bad guy is called the Sand Spider. And, and uh, the boss goes, why? He goes, probably because it sounds cool. <laughs> uh, that's well, here's no well i just want to make sure it's in the right spot it's not really a revelation or anything but he actually explains it somewhat in the book that they are called the void bringers because they have they do not have the connection to roshar that the listeners have that's why they call themselves the listeners they hear roshar they can speak to the rhythms the humans have a void there there's nothing there they they are these odd characters so they are void bringers and they've brought that and they have brought odium to roshar and so, the unmade like so they have brought all of this speculation time just awful gross horrendous speculation time i hate you craig why no this is <laughs> this, this, I'm always always wrong. Wrong. this is something about. i i don't have the answers or anything but uh, there have been a few moments in this book i i'm trying to remember was it when moash was like doing his manual labor oh, or something yeah, yeah. and there are so there are a couple of moments where it seems like humans are working to some sort of rhythm and rhythm of work or, you know, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know exactly how the rhythms work or anything. So I, I don't know, but that coupled with the fact that there are other places in the Cosmere with human life mm -hmm. and these humans invaded Roshar and who was here before? Was it a world populated by these Parshendi with shells or whatever? Or did, did you know, Odium and these other shards coming to Roshar, was there a change wrought upon humans that were already there? Mm -hmm. Like, it, are they really that separated uh, species-wise? I'm thinking back to Mistborn. Um, at the end of Mistborn, spoiler alert, everybody, at the end of Mistborn, uh, we are informed that no there really was a physical difference between the ska and the nobles mm -hmm. uh, that the lord ruler kind of fiddled with their biology uh, just a little bit and so you know could it be that these are basically humans fighting each other yeah and that the parshendi were at some point in the past manipulated physically there is some evidence to 
help that theory a little bit in the previous books. Yeah. When we look back at the, um, it's not the day of recurrence uh, vision, but there are some of Dalinar's visions where he sees people who he assumes to be human, but they are referred, they are, he's told that they are Parshani, that they seem to look that way. Um, we also have Rock talking about uh, the, the portion where we were listening to Rock or having Rock's story where he was talking about um, he could almost hear, he could, he was working to rhythms that he could almost, uh, right. to melodies that he could almost remember. I would think, I, I, I'm inclined to believe based on what I know here that the, the planet of Roshar has these, the same way that um, Nalthus has the the colors and things like that. Is that Nalthus? I'm pretty sure that's Nalthus. Oh boy. Um, Send all emails to Ryan at the legendarympodcast.com. <laughs> Just re-listen to the Warbreaker podcast and I do not remember you saying the name of the planet once. I'm pretty sure it's Nalthus that is uh, where Warbreaker takes place. So they have the, the color situation there. Here we might be dealing more with song um, and that could be affected, that could be something that is affected by shards. Um, but I'm not 100% on board with that yet but the thing is they they weren't called the parsheni they've always they referred to themselves as the listeners mm -hmm. and i think that those who are more native to the land or who have been there long enough or who have found a way to connect will hear those that which is why rock says he may be able to hear things like that because that seems to be very much part of his culture yeah be a part of that whereas the alethi are not anywhere near they're more of the dominate the place control it go from there um so there's some, I think there's some some bearing to what you've said. Yeah. Also, we don't usually sit this close together, and I didn't realize just how much ear hair you have. I do. Yeah. I have hobbit feet and hobbit <laughs> ears. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was so distracted while you were talking. I'm it, it a dolphin everywhere else. but <laughs> yeah. it, it may be the lighting could uh, be helping, too. Okay. So... Uh, let's let's uh, oh uh, Harvey Greenfield brings up an interesting point, which is: Do we now know what the Tranquiline Halls are? So has this religion uh, come sprung up out of this event when humans were brought from somewhere else, and now they think back to uh, mm. to their their homeland is their the Tranquiline planet. Halls? Yeah, it could be could be something like that. Yeah. Anyway, I liked that. I thought it was a good thought. Uh, Todd, were you about to say something? I was about to say, and are we more convinced than ever before that Teravangian is not to be trusted? The man who was the man who was prepared to sacrifice everybody else on the planet in order to take care of his own little city, um, uh, where where Dalinar is trying to resist Odium, it seems very much like Teravangian is willing to bargain with Odium right to the very end, and that's what this at least it feels to me like that's what this diagram is all about it's how to get the best angle how to get the most of his of his sure. land saved from odium's grasp yeah yeah so i put him on the same level as moash I'm ready really? to just I'm ready to put them both on a train and just really? f the yeah. train there's a <laughs> wow i'm still a little bit more mad at moash there's been terrible before we jump on the let's let's have our little hate fest on Moash here. Bleep Moash. There's Teravangian has one moment um, that he says something that made me stop and think for a little bit because he's talking with Dalinar and Dalinar says, "Have you ever come to the sudden realization that you are not the man everyone thinks you are?" Yes, Teravangian whispered. More daunting, however, are similar moments when I realize I'm not the man I think myself as being, and I want to know at any given time because of his. I'm smart, I'm stupid, I'm smart, I'm stupid, deal. What sort of man does he think he is? Because when he finds out, he says, I'm not that man. Because that's a major conflict that Teravangian could be carrying. That is a potential something you could exploit later in the series. Maybe a redemptive factor, or maybe a, something that pushes him entirely over the edge. Like, you, you believe yourself to be this man, and the only way for you to actually be this, because you feel like you have failed, is for you to do X. Do why? I'm kind of curious as to what that could be. I'll buy that. That'll be fun to find out. I'm sure it's going to be there. All right. Um, let me ask you this, Ryan. Uh, the future two books, books four and five, mm -hmm. do we know yet? Has there been an announcement who their kind of point of view character is going to be? I'm very curious to see one of them. Um, one of them's got to be Yasna, right? Not necessarily. We really thought one of them no. was going to be Eshenai. Because it was originally supposed to be Eshenai and Zeth. Yeah. 
And the next one will be Zeth, I would be my guess, because he was supposed to be three, um, but uh, it ended up being Dalinar, because Dalinar was originally supposed to be five. A lot of a lot of what we're reading in this story was originally supposed to be in five, which is the end of this portion of the story. Um, so I would guess that um, I can't really say yet because we haven't read part five, but Zeth, there's a specific story that is uh, he is about to embark on that I would say we will follow that pretty heavily in book four would be my guess. And then book five, I would not be surprised to see whatever Venley becomes be our book five story. Um, and that's where she can connect with Relaine because that needs to happen at some point. So she knows she's not alone. <laughs> so you don't like they don't, the... They don't have to hook up. They just need to find each other so that they can... Did you just put rhythms. air quotes around hook up? Because I don't know how insectoid humanoids... Populate, we but we're just gonna go offline. with hook up with yeah. quotation marks on my fingers. Do you want a quote about love? Uh, yes, I think I've got the same quote. That would be interesting. <laughs> this one is from Navani. Oh, is this? Uh, uh, okay, all right. I'll just let him read it. N- uh, Navani talking about Dalinar, um, but she had learned that nobody was strong all the time. Not even Dalinar Colin. Love wasn't about being right or wrong, but about standing up and helping when your partner's back was bowed. He would likely do the same for her someday. And the one that I pulled was um, when I think it's Yasna is reading to um, to Dalinar from the from the Way of Kings. Yes, and she says the question she replied is not whether you will love, hurt, dream, and die. It is what you will love, why you will hurt, when you will dream, and how you will die. This is your choice. You cannot pick the destination, only the path. Dalinar dropped the keys again, sobbing. I just, I, this was another spot where I was driving home and I just, I pulled over, got off the freeway, pulled into a gas station and just sat there and wiped my eyes for a little bit and then put gas in the car. Um, the, I, I, I'll, I'll, good. I'm sure I'll return to this point many, many times uh, for however long we read Sanderson, but there are a lot of people out there who say his writing isn't very uh, beautiful. Uh, you know, he doesn't turn a phrase. He's not very poetic. He's not this or that or the other. His his prose is utilitarian, that sort of thing. Then I say, well, that, that's fine. I mean, if it's not your aesthetic, it's not your aesthetic. But it, for me, it, it is extremely beautiful, and it's not necessarily the prose itself. It's what's contained therein. Yeah, I and I would I would contend that this is good stuff. I, yeah, I I would say that that he's he's selective about when he chooses to use it. Um, he, he, he tells a great story and he spends a lot of time with a lot of details about that story and he makes choices about where he's going to put in these more meaningful, more beautifully written, more artfully cre- crafted sections that are about the writing themselves. The stories, uh, the, I, I feel like every time Wit shows up, I'm getting one of those. I feel like every time I'm getting something that Dalinar is quoting from the book with the way of Kings or that we get a chance to read those other pieces. That's a place where those things are going to show up where he says, yeah, I can, I can do just as good a job of telling these beautiful pieces, writing these beautiful pieces as anybody else. But I want to insert that as part of my story. I don't want to do it instead of doing my story. He does. Uh, he has a moment where he writes in here, something that I actually kind of thought, are you talking directly to me right now, Sanderson? Not necessarily my situation or anything, but like, you, are you trying to explain to me what you're doing as an author here? Because it's when Dalinar is reviewing The Way of Kings. He mm-hmm. um, says he understood the words, but at the same time, he seemed to be missing what the book said. It was a sequence of vignettes about a king who left his palace to go on a pilgrimage. Dalinar couldn't define, even to himself, what he found so striking about the tales. Was it their optimism? Was it their talk of paths and choices? It was so unpretentious, so different from the boast of society or the battlefield. Just a series of stories their morals ambiguous and i was like hmm that's kind of how i feel about most of his writings that while there is a clear plot and while there are often very insightful lessons inside of it he generally keeps things somewhat ambiguous in terms of making a decision on things um, and lets you bring your story your personal piece into it so that things end up standing out to you that may not stand out to anybody else it's um, in many ways, 
forgive me, I don't mean to compare this to scripture, but uh, the way that a lot of people approach reading scripture mm-hmm. is that wherever you are in life at that time, you can get something from scripture yeah. that way. Yeah, I bet. And that. so like something like this, I got a paragraph here that, um, like I said, my second read through was a lot more Kaladin centric. And this is a Kaladin piece. Um, he's looking at Shalon and he's kind of trying to deal with his feelings for her and what what's going on there. He said, something felt warm within him at being near her. Something felt right. It wasn't, it wasn't like with Laurel, his boyhood crush, or even with Tara, his first real romance. It was something different, and he couldn't define it. He only knew he didn't want it to stop because it pushed back the darkness. It's a nice little section there, but if you've ever been in a dark place, sometimes there are people who just push that away, and it's different than any other sort of love or any other sort of connection that you have with anybody and it's unique and it's yeah. beautiful and so something like that only it may mean something different to someone else but it's it was beautiful to me at a very difficult time yeah well we've talked almost for an hour already and what we, we and we punching. oh my gosh <laughs> let me finish i'm sorry okay we haven't gotten to two very punching. important things that happen in especially section four uh <sighs> Cognitive realm. Cognitive realm. Shadesmar. Uh, let's talk about yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Shadesmar now. Zots and Crambles. I don't know what that means. I assume <laughs> it's a reference to something that I'm not familiar with. Uh, maybe Hitchhiker's Guide. That's what I always go to whenever I hear something kind of bizarre that I'm like I don't recognize that because I've never read read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Really? Oh. I know. I know. I've been kind of saving myself in case we do it on the podcast. Uh, I, I was going to say I think that yeah. sounds like something we got to do. Yeah. So anyway, They're Zots great. and Crambles wonders: uh, Does the cognitive realm have its own cognitive realm? If humans are doing thinky things in the cognitive realm, where are those ideas? Is there a bead for Shadesmar animals? Uh, I don't know. Wow. I do think it's interesting that we haven't talked about Shadesmar yet, just because uh, it's, as I was reading, I wasn't that enamored of yeah. the section. I wasn't yeah. that interested in it. I I didn't find it very engaging story-wise or, or setting-wise. And so in my mind, it's kind of easy to just go, oh, yeah, they went there on their way to something else. Um, as for what's there, does it, does the cognitive realm have its own cognitive realm? Well, we need Ken here to talk about time loops and stuff maybe, but I wrote down (laughs) in my notes, um, for Shadesmar that it was simultaneously fascinating and boring. Um, I really would like to spend some time reading about Shadesmar and I guess I'm going to spend some time on the on the 17th shard trying to figure that out. But I, I felt like it was interrupting the story that I wanted to to read. And so while I was reading that and going, huh, that's interesting. Get out of my way. Huh, that's interesting. Get out of my way. I'm going, yeah. like, I keep, I, because, I, because there's so much of this, and, and it's his style and it's his writing style, and, I, and I, I appreciate it. I recognize it. But this was one of those where I'm like, okay, this time through, yes, I recognize I'm going to have to come back and really think about this, but I don't want to spend the time right now. So at the end of section four, where are we um, as far as that group? They're at the platform wanting to go to get back to okay. wanting to the get... real world, but so, they have this whole army of evil sprints. Good. Okay. So I, I didn't want to, I, I don't want to spoil anything and I won't. Um, if I were writing this book myself, <laughs> I can't even say that with a straight <laughs> face. Uh, it, but if it were me telling the story, I kind of think, especially because this is such a huge book, and if you want to trim something out, I think it would be kind of effective and interesting to basically leave that group behind for an entire section uh, for an entire part of the book. And then, you know, you go on with your Dalinar storyline or whatever else, and you don't know where they are and everybody's freaking out and suddenly they pop back up and then, you know, they can tell you a little bit like, Oh my gosh, we got trapped in Shadesmar or whatever. But I might, if it were me, I might cut that entire thing out. Well, and you would be so pissed. If they had actually done it that way. Well, right. and, and really that's what's happened in a lot of other situations. Yasna disappears and we kind of get the feeling that she's in Shadesmar mm-hmm. and she just pops back up and she won't tell us a thing. Azure showing up when, when they get into Shadesmar, she says, oh, I hate this place. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, well, okay, we, we knew you went there at the end of Warbringer, but you know, why do you hate this place? We haven't heard anything else. So this, this feeling of, Oh, now we finally get the the 
the list, we start talking about it a little bit more. And I'm like, great. I'm glad we're going to do that. Do we have to do it now? It's like clean up your room before you get to have dessert. I, do I have to do it now? Just give me my dessert. Thank you very much. This is a section that I, I have a feeling that going back in time, like when we go back and have everything laid out in front of us, will carry a lot more weight than we realize. Because as you've talked about before, Brandon does a fantastic job of setting the table with things and then long game payoff here. Sure. This book, actually, I can arguably say, has done more to clarify the three realms than any of the previous books. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, By default, because the other any other book had nothing. <laughs> had very minimal. We got to see, you know, we get to see Shades Mar a little bit with Shalon when she tries to do... Um, soul casting. Soul casting, thank you. I don't know why I was going with transmogrification. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> going Calvin Hobbes. Thank you, Calvin. Totally different. Aww. Um Yes, yeah, so we get to see it a little bit in Way of Kings. Um, we don't really deal with it. She's told not to go back there because it's dangerous. We actually get to see it here, and we start to learn about how Spren work. And that's the value of being in Shades, Mars. We're starting to understand a little bit more about Spren and that this is how you connect to other worlds. We've talked about shard pools, things like that. This is the travel connection between them. And there is something that has happened here. There's some things going on in this world that are affecting the physical world on a very, very strong level in the sense that they can't get out of here, apparently. Like, you can't just jump in and out somehow, or maybe you can jump in, but you can't just jump back out of it. Um, this section actually helped me better to understand the three realms. Um, when Syl's talking, and she's talking about... Um, actually, I love... First things first, I love Syl and Pattern, who are supposed to be enemies. Yes. Their relationship is working out great. I, there's another ship if you want to <laughs> ship some spren. Um, but Syl starts talking and she's remembering more, which is a lot of how Brandon uses, uh, teaches us things. It's spren remembering things. It's the storm father remembering things. Um, and she talks about how our land, every land, is three realms. The highest is the spiritual, where gods live. They're all things, times and places and spaces uh, that are made into one. We are now in the cognitive realm, Shades Mar, where spren live, and you are from the physical realm. And the only way I know of to transfer is to be pulled by human emotions. So the answer to your question is, are there cognitive, like, are there cognitive spread inside of Crochet's Mart? No. No. I'm going to say no. Um, and then we get the connection to the, shade, the shard pool, as Azure says, no, nah, there's another way out of here. I've used it. It's called perpendicular or whatever. It's, and that's how we get out of here. Um, I get in the context of what's going on in this story, especially where we just left and where we're trying to go that this feels like the biggest waste of time, but it won't be in the context of the large story. Oh, I'm sure. And getting to know a little bit more about Honor Spren, what Syl oh, is and how yeah. important that she actually is as the that? last remaining Honor Spren from the original grouping that was created by Honor himself and not just, or hold on, that might be false doctrine. She was created by the Stormfather. She was created by the Stormfather, the first generation with the storm father not the first one of honor hey if i'm gonna correct can i, I better know my <laughs> i i'm just i i'm only laughing because i can't even begin to like try to keep all this stuff straight i can't i can't do it but um i think that's why i'm able to enjoy this a little bit more and also to say that in the long run if this was if you just sent them away and then brought them back not only would that feel too convenient you would be missing important information that you would have to deal with later that you would be irritated that you had to deal with it later instead of just getting it ahead out of the way maybe, early. Maybe. Yeah, if, and, they, if they zipped away with Azure, with Azure and then all of a sudden they came back and she wasn't there, we'd say, what happened to her? And then we'd when we distracted. When we get to the end of book five, that's that's fine. Like, all questions should... Well, I mean, you know, relatively speaking, all questions should be answered and uh, we should all have satisfactory... Uh, the Except for the part questions. that goes sideways. Well, anyway, no, but my, but my point is, I guess, just in the context of this book. Yes. Okay. That's, yes. that's all I mean. Mm -hmm. is like, it's not like this isn't good information or whatever. It was just, just in the context of this book and the structure of this book, I was not happy to go to Shadesmar. I get that. And, and to, if you take a parallel to another form of artwork, though, I feel like if we get too tied up with that looks stupid or that sounds stupid. It's like watching a painter paint, a master painter work on something and they've got this blotch of gray and this beautiful landscape here. And we're like, 
what's that? That doesn't, that, it looks terrible inside of everything else you've got here. It makes no sense. In the end, it ends up being a very critical piece. So milk, there. milk truck. Yeah, milk truck. Driving yeah. through the, the countryside. Something like that. Okay. Beautiful clouds. I, I just get hesitant to, to label stuff like that before it's finished. Um, this is a rapid fire piece. Okay. Rapid fire. Do you think that there's some allomancy going on in the Roshar? Yes. Because I, I do. The metal thing that we, uh, was it Teravangian talking about how um, somebody was somebody brought in metal plates and there was a there was a reference that they needed the metal so that there is the other one I'm connecting with is at, with Azure yes. when they're hiding the soul caster mm -hmm. there's a couple of things here and I'm not necessarily sure that it's Alamancy it's part of investiture in the whole piece there but shiny metal plates equals aluminum generally and aluminum we have learned from Mistborn spoiler alert is a negating power, which is why they're able to hide it. So there is something about aluminum that's working in Roshar. And the other piece is when Azure shows up and they're asking, he's asking, um, Kaladin's asking about the captain before they meet her. Um, they're, they talk about how they felt that um, it felt like we had Spren at our backs holding us up and helping oh, us fight. And I was like, yeah. soothing, soothing and rioting, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. Soothing and rioting, maybe? Because by this point in time, she has been out for... We don't know exactly how long off the top of my head. I think it's been a couple hundred years because she makes some comment about it. But Well, and I wondered too, as I was reading that, is when is this happening in context of the Mistborn story? Um, is, this, is this before Harmony? Is this after Harmony? Is this contemporary with the Wax and Wayne series that was going on? Mm -hmm. I, because that also has an impact on Odium's role and how Ruin fits into this. I, that was... Anyway. It could be quite a ways after when we get into the space travel level and like ken made the comment in his opener about that are these people from scadriel like could this be that you know that's how the humans invade i'm not really on board that train um but it there's enough but there hey, to why believe. not but yeah yeah so speaking of visitors from other worlds we we do need to start closing up but i just wanted to quickly ask about azure uh does anybody care that she's there Ryan does because uh, Ryan cares. As soon as I saw, as soon as they said Azure, I was like, "Oh, colors! I think I know where this one's going." Oh yeah, we've I had got, no idea. We've it got, took me a while. We've got Nightblood. We've got um, Zahil, Zahil, uh, yeah. Zahil, um, or Vasher. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so when we when when Azure shows up and they said, "Yeah, but she's a she. Don't tell anybody." I, I kind of went. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is gonna get good. <laughs> I I enjoyed it. I this is was it a big? <laughs> it was a surprise reveal for you then. It was, yeah. I mean, I didn't guess it right out front. Um, the in, in my in my initial review. So Ryan and I read the advanced review copies, and we did our uh, thing. But I also wrote up a review, and I referenced that there are things in this book that make it feel bloated if you aren't in on it. Yeah. Uh, and this is one of those things where this is a character who just, again, in the context of this book, or even you could say in the context of this series so far, um, we're being asked to care about something we don't need to care about. She comes into the story, she's kind of interesting, and uh, if you'll excuse the pun, colorful. Um, but she... She ultimately, she, she comes into our lives and then just leaves. She's like, uh, I, she serves I, a purpose. I'm out of here. What I think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But, I, uh, but I guess, back. but my, my point is that, um, I'm not saying she serves no purpose. I'm just saying that um, she certainly doesn't serve the purpose that, uh, that any other character with her page count does in the book. Um, at, at the end of this book, if I didn't know who she was, if I wasn't familiar with Warbreaker, if I didn't, if I wasn't kind of, uh, again, pun, sorry, if I wasn't invested in the Cosmere, then I would go, well, why did you have her in there? That yeah. was one more character that you could have cut, yeah. you know? And so that, that's kind of how I felt about her. I was glad she was there. I was glad I read her, but looking through the eyes of somebody who isn't familiar with the rest of the Cosmere, it feels like maybe it would come across as bloat. To give them someone who knows their way around Shadesmar and introduce the perpendicularity. Ah, uh, the great apologist. Well, I also... That's, that is, aside from being a stabilizing piece of Kolinar, 
that's her two biggest contributions sure. there. And I can understand there's other ways you can approach it. One of the reasons why I was so excited about it, I don't know that everyone understands that Warbreaker is a prologue to the Stormlight Archive. That is a 100% Brandon Sanderson approved statement. Okay. Warbreaker is a prologue to Stormlight. You're, I, you you look prequel. like you're waiting for us to like hug you or something. Like, thank you I'm waiting for to, dropping this all over <laughs> us. I'm trying to get a gauge reactions to how well that is being received or understood because that is something when I first read it, I was like, oh, because Warbreaker is one of my favorites in the series. Mm -hmm. mm, for a lot of people as a standalone book novel, it's it's probably one of the lower end ones, but it's one of my favorites. Yeah, I enjoyed Warbreaker. And when I found out that it was serving a purpose to introduce characters that could not come into the Stormlight Archive in the beginning, I went, oh, yes. So when I found Vasher in Zyle, I was like, there it is. There's this connection. And then Azure shows up and I got super excited. I'm like, Vivana, you're back. Yay, fantastic. <laughs> the two characters that I needed from Warbreaker to carry over, I'd, the rest of them can stay where they're at. It's fine. I don't need to know more. Oh, and Nightblood. Nightblood. Which... Also ties me into her shard, shard blade, shard blade. I don't know what to call it. Shard blade. <laughs> her blade, which is not night blood, but is some sort of similar replica. Um, did they try again? Did they get one of the original ones that they tried to make that didn't work out? Because it's not a shard blade, but it is a shard blade. It's not a spren. It's and it's not night blood, but it's and the honor spren are fascinated by it because it doesn't piss them off. Oh, this is a shard. This works just like a shard blade, but it's not made of a spren's corpse. Wow, we like this concept. Yeah, yeah. You can hang out with us at our table. All right. I well, my my other thing about Azure, we had a conversation for parts one and two about how there's all this change and women are, you know, taking on men's roles and Renarn is trying out like this engineering thing when libraries with the women. And here you have Azure, who is a soldier, and she's a princess and a ruler, and she, um, like, she's somebody that Kaladin and Adolin and Shallan can relate to on some level, and kind of see, oh, there's this difference. Like, there's, this, I, she is somebody who has been leading a whole platoon, and people accept her. Like, there, there is a possibility for change. There is a possibility that, that we can be a part of this change, and people won't freak out. All right, I'll buy yeah. that. Yeah. So, final thoughts. We've really got to wrap this up. I'm sorry, but we'll go around the horn. Todd, you want to start us off with final thoughts? Ooh, final thoughts. Um, I loved the the little little bits and pieces that we got with Zeth, especially the especially the battle, the uh, the the trial battle that they were having with the colors. As soon as they said whoever has the most uh, marks on them, I said to myself. And I know exactly where this one's going to end. And yes, indeed, it did. And it was beautiful. You live by the letter of the law. You die by the letter of the law. And Zeth comes out squeaky clean and winning the, winning the whole deal, even though he got pelted mercilessly. I, would, I, I, I look forward to seeing this on, on, a, on a big screen movie adaptation at some point in time. I think it's going to be really cool. The other thing that I have that I love, Sanderson every now and again throws in humor and you I'm always looking for the humor stuff and this was one that I found it was when uh when they're in Shadesmar and Adolin's talking to Pattern he says you know I've never really felt like this before it's not just Kaladin it's all of us and what's happening to us he shook his head we're certainly an odd bunch and Pattern says yes seven people odd <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh, oh what character is it that I'm thinking of who oh uh from Guardians of the Galaxy Drax yeah. Who doesn't understand oh, uh, symbolism or irony? He's very or, literal. You yeah, just yeah. need Catch to him. find a person who is pathetic, like, like you. you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, Megan. Final thought. I really appreciate the way character the character of Elokar was handled. I am still really angry. Oh that boy, he we was never killed. even got into this stuff. I feel like we need to at least mention it. Okay. I'm still angry that he was killed when he was, especially because he like it, it's been telegraphed since mm -mm, the Way of mm -mm. Kings that he was paranoid because he was seeing the people with the symbols for heads and here he is with his son and you have Kaladin who is somehow like just frozen and just watching and cannot help even though he has he's watching like everybody that he's trying to protect die again um after all of these oaths 
And then you have Moash come in and he gives the sign after doing exactly what Kaladin asked him not to do. Like, it just, it was You don't get to claim bridge And I was very, very angry. Never again. I was very angry, but it was written really beautifully. And I I blame myself because I was reading up to that section. I was like, you know, there's no way everybody gets out of this alive. And then like everybody died. And I just, it's my fault. Just, just for fun. One day I'm going to, if you've never seen this, you need to go read the Jonathan V. Last defense of the empire in uh, A New Hope. Yeah. It's fantastic. I'm going to do this one day for Moash that just, for the sole purpose of exploding Ryan's head. Like, it, it will kill you. I think book seven and is going to be Moash. I, and I will relish that. I am going to write the defense of Moash. And not, I, I haven't worked I this out yet. I don't know what my defense is going to be, but one day... I'm, Craig has seen the way he's going to die. It will be a spear through the eye while I go like this at him. <laughs> <laughs> a spear through the eye and a sword through the chest. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, all right, Ryan. Uh, were you going to riff on that? I just really quick... the. That section, the way he wrote that, is one of the most cinematic mm-hmm. written sections in yeah. this book. Yeah, I can I I can watch the book as I read it, no problem. That section I can see so clearly that if I had the actors and a camera, I could shoot it shot for shot exactly the way that I the way that I saw it there without any problem. Like I I came out of that going, wow. Not only do I hate Moash, but I can see this whole thing. Yep. From every angle right you, now. You it's can, so good. Yeah. Um, All right, your final thought. I'm going to try and speed through a couple things here real quick because it's... Um, this is a continuous question that we have yet to have answered, but we got a little taste of what might be an answer here. Why does Kaladin's scar not get, get healed? We deal with it with the tattoos at one point in time. So that um, In the chapter Bondsmith, when uh, Dalinar fixes a bunch of things... Um, it says, once the soul grows accustomed to the wound, it is much harder to fix. And I believe that, and I've held this for a while, but I believe that the reason Kaladin's scars don't heal is because he identifies with them as that that is the truth. And didn't the, we didn't we talk about this in one of the previous books? Uh, I think I brought up the uh, the Matrix uh, when he when he takes his first trip to the Matrix and he says, "Well, like my hair's back." And he goes, we call it residual self-image. Oh, yeah, that's like right. Like, that, that's kind of the same concept that I picture. Like, this is how he identifies. This is who he is in his own head. And so he's not letting those scars go away. Yeah, and I think that we. I'm going to guess that by the time he gets to being able to swear whatever fourth, fifth ideal, whatever he's at, that that might be the moment that those disappear. And I'm kind of hoping that that's, that that's the case. Um, the other one is just one more Cosmere piece here. We finally learn how store how gem how the uh, chips are infused. Stormfather explains how Stormlight is infused into those, which maybe no one else cares. For me, it was, I was always like, I kind of want to understand that a little bit better because I need to know what power they're using when you're trying to deal with investiture and understanding that concept. Knowing where the power comes from that they are pulling from matters. In Alamance, you know you're dealing with, you know, the metals and. There. So this one, um, honor's power during a storm is concentrated in one place. The storm father said it pierces all three realms and brings physical, cognitive, and spiritual together momentarily in one. The gemstones exposed to the wonder of the spiritual realm are lit by the infinite power there. Two things about that: one, the power inside of the the stormlight is from the spiritual realm itself, so they are drawing their power from the spiritual realm itself. The other thing is, that means that people who have been in a high storm, Kaladin and Shallan specifically out there, have experienced the spiritual realm at some point in time because honor's power is so uh, concentrated. concentrated in one place that they have been able to experience that, which is perhaps why they see the storm father or why they're able to communicate or jump into these other visions. So looking back at the previous ones, I'm wondering if they visited the spiritual realm briefly while they're in the pillar of honor's power that causes all of these gemstones didn't, to come Didn't through. Dalinar walk out during a high storm as well? Mm-hmm. In one of his in one of his recollections. One of the flashbacks. Mm-hmm. So again we have Which could also be part of how honor sending messages honor which is dead sending messages can, that can only happen during the high storms. The high storms, which we're now dealing with in this story that wherever the high storm is, they can bring someone else into a vision. So wherever honor's power is concentrated there someone can possibly be connected through the spiritual realm 
is my guess. That's kind of what I'm trying to pull from this moment. I think it's a big deal. It's a bigger deal than we made it than, than just, this is how you light up the gems. It's going to be it. And in book six, Brandon Sanderson will tell us all about it. <laughs> you mean B sand? <laughs> I'm not going to call him B sand. Um, it's Mr. Sanderson. Well, Can't I've discovered it. today uh, a new thing about myself, which is that the podcast has really trained my attention span. Uh, because we've been going now for about an hour 15. Oh, wow. And uh, my attention span is about an hour long. <laughs> we've, we've trained you. Yeah. You paid real close attention while we were talking about how bored we were with Shades of Mire. Oh, that's true. Uh, all right. But no, <laughs> seriously, though, I'm going to skip anything I might have said just because we're, we are running a little bit long. So let's cut out and run. Uh, but I will thank everybody for listening. Uh, thank you very, very much. And if you're watching, thank you for watching. And do us a favor. If you enjoy these episodes, well, that's a little weird. But if you enjoy these episodes, share these episodes with your friends uh, or your, your internet uh, communities of peeps. Subscribe and share. Subscribe and share. Is that the shorthand? Yeah. Hit the little it's bell the new icon. SS. What's SS? And please I mean, subscribe besides, and share. In the conversation, we have the... The, uh, the subreddit um, for Legend Jerry on this episode. Please don't spoil part five because I still haven't read it. Oh, that's Thank true. Thank you in advance. <laughs> um, yeah, please don't spoil part five. Please. And just a reminder for anybody who wants in on the Oathbringer advanced review copy giveaway, go to Twitter, tweet at Legendarium Pod and make sure you include the hashtag Oathbringer and you'll be entered for that. Now, uh, if you've never had an advanced review copy, it's kind of interesting. Uh, it's, it's not the finalized copy, so they're just you know little, little typos. The, uh, the printing isn't as uh, crisp and everything, so it's kind of fun to read this, uh, this weird old copy. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so hopefully you guys enjoy that, and uh, we will see you in three weeks for the finale, I believe, three weeks for the finale of Oathbringer, uh, it'll be part five, and we'll discuss the book as a whole at that point. Although I don't imagine we'll get much past the stuff in just part five. It'll it'll take up uh, whatever, how many hours we want to throw at it. Um, but in the meantime, hope you're enjoying our Narnia episodes as well. If you haven't listened to any of those, go listen to those. It's kind of a breath of fresh air after all this uh, super heavy, uh, dense prose from uh from b sand mr b sand uh you can go check out the narnia episodes they are quick easy to digest just like the books anyway thanks again everybody we will see you next time and uh thanks for listening <laughs>